And we will um, continue our discussion this time with Professor Sir Michael Marmot. So if I've known Jack for 30 years, I just calculated how long it is. <laughs> it's not good. <laughs> so I have known Michael for 40 years, um, actually. And uh, he started off at Berkeley at graduate school um, in the epidemiology department where we first met. And um, in his 35 years of leading research groups and special commissions, Dr. Uh, Marmot has produced several definitive reviews on health inequalities in both national and global context. Perhaps um, these days best known for chairing the WHO's Commission on Social Determinants of Health from 2005 to 2008. He's, um, led major studies on inequality, in fact, probably has done some of the best earliest work on looking at socioeconomic differentials in health, um, starting from the Whitehall studies and continuing through British civil servants, um, English longitudinal study of aging. And in 2000, Dr. Marmot was knighted by Her Majesty the Queen for his service to epidemiology and to the understanding of health inequalities. Michael. Will something happen to me? No? Ah, thank you. It really is 40 years. Um, and somebody asked me, why did you come to this? And I said, because Lisa invited me to come to this. How could I not? And what a wonderful celebration it is. And uh, how wonderful it is to join in that celebration. Jack Rowe talked about the life course. I have a slightly more prosaic account of the life course. When you're young, you worry about wetting the bed. And then when you get a bit older, you start thinking about sex. And when you get a bit older still, you think about work and family and all those things. Then when you get older still, you start thinking about sex. And then when you get really old, you start worrying about wetting the bed. <laughs> But there's got to be a more positive view of it than that. I will talk more about aging, because knowing Lisa's interests today, I could talk about other parts of the life course. I'm not going to talk so much about research, but what I've been involved in in the last few years is trying to package what we know from the best research into a form that might influence policy. Lisa mentioned the Commission on Social Determinants of Health, the WHO Commission, which we published in 2008. And one of the big questions when you do something like this is, anybody listening? The, the half-life of commission reports is about three months, I think. 50% uh, are gone without trace in three months, and most are gone without trace within six months. In the case of the WHO Commission, we put some effort in trying to change that by encouraging a small number of countries to be champions for the argument, including my own. And I was commissioned by Prime Minister Gordon Brown, to address the question of how could we apply the recommendations of the Global Commission to one country, England. And I published that report in 2010, and we called it Fair Society, Healthy Lives. I was addressing the American Public Health Association conference in Boston in the end of October, beginning of November last year, and I thought it was sort of private. I could just share something in private with the 7,000 people who are in the audience. And I expressed my regret that I had given the report the name Fair Society Healthy Lives. The reason we gave it that name was we said if you put fairness at the heart of all policy making, health would improve and health inequalities would diminish. Why regret? And I said my regret was because the Conservative-led coalition government in Britain used the word fairness as if it had no meaning at all. They cut the top rate of tax and they called it fair. 
They cut tax credits for the poor and they said it was fair. They cut services to the disadvantaged and they said it was fair. And I said, I call it a grotesque parody of fairness. The next thing I find out is that Gabriel Scally, a public health doctor who was there, wrote a blog in the BMJ, grotesque parody of fairness. And this did the rounds and I thought, there goes the funding for my Institute of Health Equity, <laughs> <laughs> Department of Health. Um, I'd like to think th that they thought there would be more trouble cutting the funding than continuing it, um, so they continued it. But indeed, I think we need to be careful. And I've been told that in Europe, people think fairness has got something to do with playing cricket. They think it's a very British thing, um, fairness. I thought if I used the term social justice, it would frighten some people. They'd think it was socialism. Uh, just if you say social anything, it frightens people. I'm talking about social justice. And fairness applied to health equity is, of course, a tautology. By health equity, we mean the systematic inequalities between social groups that are judged to be avoidable by reasonable means. And if they're not avoided, that's unfair, inequitable. So at the heart of what we're trying to do is social justice. And then I was invited by Susanna Jakob, the regional director of WHO for Europe, to do a review of social determinants and the health divide in the European region of WHO, which includes 53 member states. I said that I do want to focus on the aging part. Uh, what I learned from Jack Rowe and Lisa about healthy aging, staying alive, avoiding disease, and having good positive physical and mental functioning. And each of these is strongly related to the social environment. So first, staying alive. And I think Lisa showed us a, a version of this this morning. Japan stays way up there at the top. I've said many times in different contexts that I do like coming to the United States. It's the only country that makes me feel good about my own. Um, <laughs> And I could apply that to all sorts of measures that I think, well, God, we're not doing very well in the UK, but there's one big country that's doing worse than us, and it's the US. Um, you, not bad, though, in the UK. We're doing just about as well as Korea at the moment, but it's not looking good. <laughs> it's not looking good. So we get these huge differences, and they can change really quickly. And that's very important, because in a way, the basis for what I've been doing with these commission reviews is based on the fact that things can change really quickly. If they can change without our making conscious efforts, then maybe our conscious efforts could do something about it. And when we look at functioning, this is from the Whitehall 2 study of British civil servants, the top one is uh, physical health scores by grade of employment. What you can see depressingly, oops, what you can see depressingly, the top one, the top one. there we go. Um, everybody's declining, these are the low grades. But look at the mean scores at 45 to 49 for the low grades and the high grades get there about 15 years later. So they're declining, but they get to that low level about 15 years later. Then look at the good news that physical, uh, psychological functioning improves with age after it gets, it's pretty rotten to be a teenager and adolescent, um, but then it gets better as you get older. But, of course, we get this dramatic gradient. And Jack used the, Jack Rowe used the words haves and have-nots. I think of have a lot, have quite a lot, 
have a middle level, have not so very much, have a bit, have very little. It's a gradient. It's not haves and have nots, but everything I look at is graded. So low grade, middle grade, high grade, low grade, middle grade, high grade. And from the ELSA, the English Longitudinal Study of Aging, we can say that people in professional and managerial classes reach the same level of disability as those in routine and manual, the lower ones, about 15 years later. And the same with illness. Lisa laid out the challenge of inequalities. It's not just are the old functional or dysfunctional, but the degree of functionality depends on social position and it's graded. The higher the social position, the more functional you are for longer. In a way, if you had the choice, would you rather be older, oh, sorry, would you rather be younger or high social status, choose high social status because you've got better mental functioning, physical functioning, less illness. This was figure one from the English Review, known in Britain as the Marmot Review, looking at life expectancy first at the top graph, life expectancy, by neighborhood income deprivation. So each of these dots represents a neighborhood classified by degree of deprivation. So here you have the least deprived, the most affluent, and there the most deprived. And what you can see is that people living in neighborhoods second from the top, near the top, have slightly shorter life expectancy than those at the top. People a third of the way from the top, shorter life expectancy than those near the top. The middle shorter than there. A third away from the bottom, shorter than the middle. All the way from top to bottom, it's a gradient. David and I were talking last night about the fact that economists love to say, I've got it wrong. That it's not that your social position causes your health, your health causes your social position. Aren't people clever? Just a little bit of ill health and you choose to live in the second most affluent neighborhood. A bit more ill health, you choose to live in the third most affluent neighborhood. If you're sort of middling, you choose to live in the middle level neighborhood. Aren't people clever? God, you know, I'm not running quite as fast as I, I think I'll move to a middle level neighborhood and so on. They're really clever. If we look at the bottom graph, we've got disability free life expectancy, so healthy life and the gradient is steeper. And that means people at the top are living 12 years of their lives on average with disability, and people at the bottom with shorter lives are living about 20 years of it on average with disability. Now, I've talked to politicians about the implications of my English review. And they say, yeah, yeah, mm-hmm, mm-hmm, yes, very good, mm-hmm, mm -hmm. well, I'm sure you have a lot to do, so I'm better. I could do a PhD in brush-offs um, from <laughs> politicians. But then I show them this solid green line. Retirement age in Britain had been 65, mandatory. The previous government wanted to increase it to 68 by 2046. The present government wants to do that more quickly. If retirement age were 68 today, you can see that three quarters of the population do not have disability-free life expectancy as long as 68. If the effect of changing retirement age from 65 to 68 was to put people on disability benefits rather than on pensions, you save no money and it's a dubious social advance. And these politicians that I've spoken to are saying, yes, yes, mm -hmm, very interesting. Mm -hmm. They suddenly go, oh my God, we've got to take this seriously. So I make the moral case. It's a matter of social justice reducing the social gradient in disability-free life expectancy. And they say, yeah, very important. We're all signed up to the moral case. 
But there's also an economic case. If you want people to work longer for economic reasons, you have to do something not just about the poor, these people down here, but disability free life expectancy across the social gradient. And of course, prolonging working age, making it harder to get the state pension, you've got to wait longer, is pretty good because you guarantee that none of these people will get there. So you don't have to pay poor people a pension. You just work and then drop dead. It's quite good social arrangement. Uh, some of us think that's a bit unfair. And you have something similar, of course, in the US. These are the haves and have-nots, um, the least deprived and the most deprived. And the, uh, for men and for women, the gap has been increasing, 1980, 1998, 2000. That's the gap. It's been increasing. But, and I think, Jack, this was, you were an author of this paper. Were you as well? Yeah. Jack and Lisa, so I thought I needed just to acknowledge how important it was. Um, looking at life expectancy at birth, showing the gradient by years of education. But alarmingly, these are women, white women, alarmingly showing the lower life expectancy for white women with the least level of education. It's actually dropping. Whether these are selection factors or who's in the groups, I'm not entirely sure, but it's a very alarming statistic that you've got this steep gradient, it's got steeper, and actually, you've got a subgroup, an important subgroup of the society where life expectancy is getting worse, which again relates to what Lisa showed us at the beginning. I'm just thinking of your thing, Jack, about the Puerto Ricans or the Hispanics are going to be paying for the older. I went to a conference at Miami Beach. And I was thinking if you did a cross-sectional study of aging, you'd probably conclude that people start life Hispanic and end up Jewish. And <laughs> I don't know quite who pays for whom there, but important to doing longitudinal studies, uh, cohort studies. So um, many people at older ages are actually doing quite well, but it follows the social gradient. You're more likely to be doing well if you're better off and aging reflects experiences across, across the life course. And of course, it's not just material wealth, but participation. In my English review, the Marmot Review, we had six domains of recommendations of what you could do. Give every child the best start in life, equity from the start. Education and lifelong learning. Fair employment and good work for all. The fourth one was really radical, really radical. In a rich society, everyone should have the minimum necessary for a healthy life. I do something really unusual for a professor. I occasionally give lectures at my medical school. And I've started talking to the first year medical students. I, the first few weeks, and I talk about minimum income for healthy living. And I say the calculation includes leading a life of dignity and participating in society. What's the minimum you need to lead a life of dignity and to participate in society? And I said we calculate for older people that part of the minimum income for for the minimum income necessary for a healthy life is having money to buy presents for your grandchildren. And I say to these bright young people, you came to UCL because you wanted to learn about genomics and proteomics, they hadn't known about populomics, uh, and metabolomics, and here's this lecturer saying, if your grandma can't afford to buy you presents, she can't have a healthy life. They love it. If, if you get them in their pre-cynical phase before they um, create and develop healthy and sustainable places and communities 
and strengthen and roll the role and impact of ill health prevention. Now, most people these days when they think about public health, they think about behaviors, smoking and drinking and diet and so on. But we take a social determinants approach to those things. I want to talk a little bit about the European review. Every other region of WHO thinks Europe's rich. It's the rich part of the world. But we have dramatic uh, differences within Europe. And the themes from the European Review, for the first time, we more explicitly acknowledge the importance of taking a human rights approach. The sainted Mary Robinson criticized me uh, for the WHO Commission. She said, I missed the opportunity to say more about human rights. And I'm a slow learner, but I got there in the end. We said, talked about resilience of individuals and communities. Again, a theme that Lisa touched on. We said empowerment of individuals, of communities, and indeed of whole countries is vital. Every stage of the life course something we learned from sustainable development, the importance of equity across the generations, intergenerational equity, joined up action. And this word that we coined, this phrase that we coined, proportionate universalism. What we mean by that is that what we've learned, particularly from the Nordic countries, is the importance of universalist policies, not focusing only on the worst off, now, the default position of British social policy is you focus on the worst off. When I've gone with graphs on the gradient to Her Majesty's Treasury, and I've had economists from the Treasury say, don't come to me with that Scandinavian nonsense. We're Anglo-Saxons. We focus on the worst off. That's what we do. Well, we talk about universalist policies, but the idea of proportionate universalism is the effort is proportionate to need. So the National Health Service in Britain is a universalist system. It's available to everybody. But you don't spend the same on everybody. You spend proportionate to need. I'd be very happy to pay my taxes my whole life and never use the NHS. That would be terrific. I'd feel that I got a bargain. So you spend proportionate to need. So that's the idea of proportionate universalism. So this is Europe, the rich nation of the world where everybody, a rich region of the world where everyone's got good health. Life expectancy for men in the Russian Federation is not quite 63. You may wonder why Israel is in Europe, but I'll explain it to you sometime. If they weren't in Europe, they'd be in the Eastern Mediterranean and imagine what that would mean. Um, Israel, Iceland, it's 80. Sweden, it's just under 80. So we've got a 17-year gap in male life expectancy within the European region. And again, you may wonder why Kazakhstan's in Europe, but it's the whole of the former Soviet Union. <clears throat> if we look at life expectancy by GDP for the European region, we see a very familiar Preston curve that down here, there's a rather steep relation between income and life expectancy. Once you get up to Portugal, Greece, Malta, they're simply, it's simply flat. It's been alleged that if you logged income, you get a straight line relation between log income and life expectancy. I don't think you could log it and make Malta and Cyprus and Israel um, and Luxembourg continue that straight line. I don't think logging it would do that. It's flat. There's no relation between national income above around 20,000 US dollars at purchasing power parities and life expectancy. So getting richer by itself for a country is not what guarantees better health. And within the European region, we've got these big differences within countries. If you look at life expectancy at 30 in Sweden, 
by education. Compulsory, upper secondary and post-secondary. The gap is increasing for men and women, not dramatically, but it's increasing. So that we've got these huge inequalities within countries, uh, between countries, and we've got increasing inequalities even in a country like Sweden. And when we look at the Russian Federation, this is life expectancy at age 20. The pro probability that a 20-year-old will survive to 65 for people with low education, and this is for university education. So, sorry, low education and university education. So the gap's increasing dramatically. We cannot look at country averages. The inequalities are the whole story. We've had a go at trying to say which is most important, uh, education, income, or material deprivation. You can see gradients in poor health for each of these, but when you look at education and you put income and material deprivation in the model, you still get a very clear gradient. When you look at material deprivation and you put education and income in the model, you still get a very clear gradient. Interestingly, when you look at income and put material deprivation and education in the model, you don't. If you trust these kinds of multivariate analyses, and I'm not sure I do, but if you trust them, it suggests that material deprivation and education are more important drivers of the gradient than is income, which actually fits with the international pattern, that it's not income that's driving these country differences. This, I think, is very important. I've got a similar graph for 25-year-olds, but because I wanted to orient it more to older people, I've looked at life expectancy at 50, and I apologize for this. This is the lowest educational group, international uh, classification, education zero to two is the lowest, and it's uh, five to six is the highest. It's a gradient, but we've pulled out the worst and the best. Look at Sweden. SE is Sweden, HU is Hungary, E is Estonia, Bulgaria, Romania, you can guess. So look at Sweden. It has the highest life expectancy at 50 of any of these European countries and the narrowest gap between those with high education and those with low education. There's been a rumor going around Europe that there's a Swedish paradox that Sweden, despite doing everything that a social democratic country does, so, I mean, somebody actually said to public meetings, Sweden's doing everything Michael Marmot recommended and they've still got these huge inequalities. And I look at this and say, huge inequalities? Inequalities, and as I showed you in a previous slide, they're getting bigger, but huge? In fact, the people with low education have about the best life expectancy of any of these countries, and the gap between the worst and the best in terms of education is very small. The second thing, though, to which I would like to draw your attention is that the variation between countries is much less for people with high education than it is for people with low education. Now, those of particular political persuasion who think that health is a matter of personal responsibility might be well advised to choose, to tell somebody with low education, you really should not choose to live in Hungary. If you've got low education, choose to go to Sweden because that's a much better place to be miserably educated than is Hungary or Estonia. Get the hell out, choose. Health's a matter of personal responsibility for whatever you do. Don't be Estonian if you've got low education. Now, in fact, we know once policies of austerity hit Estonia, about 10% of the country migrated. They're a poster child for austerity. People left, it was so ghastly. 
But what it means is that these countries do actually know how to deliver good health for people with good education. They're much less good at delivering good health for people with low education. And so the gradient varies enormously. And commonly, we see less variation in women than men. And that's what we see there. Is this just about medical care? Well, no, it isn't, actually. Health expenditure per capita and survival to age 65 for women, it really is not just about expenditure on medical care. And if we look uh, male survival, there's really not a very good relationship between expenditure on health care per capita and we looked at this territory a few years ago, looking at the US and England. The US spends two and a half times, or is that probably about three times now, but at the time we did this, it, the US spent two and a half times as much per head on health care as we did in the UK at purchasing power parities. And the question is, what do you get for that? And the answer is, not much. For seven major diseases, I've got three of them here, the US was sicker than England. These were men and women, white men and women, aged 55 to 64. You see the social gradient by income in both places. Look at diabetes. The low income English actually have about the same level of diabetes as the high-income Americans. Obesity clearly must be playing a role in that, but this is not all due to obesity. But it doesn't argue that your two and a half times greater expenditure per head on medical care was buying you much. So. Th this was the conceptual framework of the European review. Life course stages, the wider society, the macro level context, and systems. And we had recommendations in each of these four major domains. For the life course, uh, we went right across the life course. If I went through all of this now, you would feel like aging was happening very rapidly. Uh, I'll just give you a little bit. What we said on older ages, intersectoral action, and that you need to take action across the life course. Uh, similar to Jack Rowe's message, aging isn't just an issue for older people, but in this case, we are saying the time to start reducing inequities in ill health in older people is at birth or preconception. In case you're wondering about the picture behind this slide, these are the indignados. These are the young people on the streets of Madrid where unemployment in the 18 to 24 year olds is 56%. In Greece, it's 60%. Now, some of those will be working in the informal economy, but it's astonishingly high, and they're really angry. They really don't like it. Some of our politicians think that unemployment is a lifestyle choice. It's not a lifestyle choice if there are no jobs to be had. If we look at poverty in older people and poverty in younger people. So this is the population poverty rate and this is the old age poverty rate. You can see that countries make different choices and these are choices because these are social policy choices. Some countries tolerate higher poverty levels in older people than the general population and some don't. And you can see 
Uh, this is at risk of poverty. What that means is people below 60% median income after social transfers, so after taxes and transfers. And these are from our European studies. So Cyprus, Bulgaria at the top, Hungary, Iceland, Luxembourg down there. Um, Sweden, for example, is about 15%. Um, these are people over age 65. Interestingly, if I showed you children in poverty for Sweden after taxes and transfers, it's about 12%. So Sweden's made the choice they'll tolerate slightly higher poverty levels in older people. Slovenia, which is up here at 20% or 15%, 15 to 20%, um, Slovenia, for older people is actually at 10% for younger people. So countries are making these choices. Where should the distribution of poverty be? And they can do that by the generosity of pensions or social policies that benefit families with young children. The point being, these are policy decisions. The Minister of Finance may be having a bigger effect on health equity than the Minister of Health. These are policy decisions. And what we've said, I'm not going to talk about young people today, but what we've said with young people I think applies to old people, which is you need to think about two strategies to deal with the social gradient in ill health. One is reduce the level of social and economic inequalities. Bring the, the social and economic conditions of those at the lower end up towards the middle. That's one strategy, reduce inequalities. And the second is break the link between social and economic conditions and worse health. So this is related to the first strategy, how much are taxes and transfers going to reduce poverty levels, but we also want to break the link. What we can see is um, that the poorer you are, the more you spend on basics. So this is the percent point change in spending as a percent of income from 2004 to 2008 in the English longitudinal study of aging. So for the poorest quintile in terms of wealth, the proportion of money they spent on basics went up over this period from 2004 to 2008. For the richest, it went down. So it means that the poorest wealth quintile had less disposable income. More was spent on heating and eating, and in fact, too commonly, choosing between heating and eating, either being in a cold home and eating, or going hungry so you could be a little bit warm. I have no doubt that your politicians in this country are much more evidence-based, reasonable in their pronouncements, uh, would never make assertions not supported by the evidence. Regrettably in Britain, we don't share the enlightenment that you have on this side of the Atlantic. And some of our politicians have equated poverty with worthlessness. The poor are worthless. And the way they know the poor are worthless is because they don't work. If they were good people, they'd be working and they wouldn't be poor. The only problem with that formulation is the data don't fit. This is workless working age or retired people, and this is people in poverty. That's actually been coming down. These are working households where at least one adult works. There are more people in poverty in working households than there are in non-working households. And in those households where at least one adult works, three quarters of the adults are working. They're not worthless. 
They're not of low moral virtue. They're not paid enough. They're low paid. That's why they're in poverty, because they're not paid enough. It's got nothing to do with their moral character. But if you listen to our politicians or read the Daily Mail, you wouldn't know that. You would think if you're in poverty, you're worthless. Otherwise, you wouldn't be in poverty. They're working. They're just low paid. Maybe there's not enough money around to pay them adequately. Everybody I know is reading Piketty's book. There is a lot of money around. There's huge amounts of money around. We just don't want to pay the people who are working enough money to have a healthy life. How can we have a state of affairs like this and tolerate it? But we can make a difference. If you look at the social gradient in poor health, for example, by European countries, and classify countries on their generosity on social protection. So countries that are pretty miserly in terms of social protection have a steep social gradient for poor health, primary education, secondary, tertiary education. The more generous the country, the narrower, the shallower the social gradient, the narrower the gap, and for women too. Poverty is bad for health. Low income is bad for health. But social policy, in terms of social protection, can make a difference. So it's an example of how you can interfere with the link between low income and poor health. Looking at work, for example, we know that effort reward imbalance increases risk of cardiovascular disease, so high effort, low reward. And we know that low control at work increases risk of cardiovascular disease, of mental illness, and sickness absence. And if we look at the distribution by occupational class, very low, low, high, very high, then the lower the occupational class, the more likely are people to report imbalance between effort and reward and low control at work. And these predict illness. They play an important role in generating the class gradient in illness. They also make it more likely for people not to want to work. Surprise, surprise. If work's really lousy, I don't want to keep doing it. So if you're a policymaker and you're saying, how can we keep people in the workplace because we can't afford to pay them pensions? Well, one way is to improve the quality of work. This is the percent in high effort, low reward jobs of working age who would like to retire. And the greater the proportion of people who are in high effort, low reward jobs, the more likely they are to say they intend to retire and leave the workplace. Improve the quality of work, you're pro probably likely to get healthier workforce, you're probably likely to get improved productivity, and people may well want to stay in the workforce for longer. Systems. Of course, health systems, but I'm not going to talk about those, um, but it includes communities. So if we think about communities from the English Longitudinal Study of Aging, this is elevated depressive symptoms by access to services and amenities in the community. So this is people who have no access problems to amenities, people who have one access problem or two or more problems with access to amenities. And the more problems they have, the more likelihood of having depressive symptoms. And going the other way, if we look at life satisfaction, the more access problems, the less the life satisfaction. That's fairly basic, isn't it? Having access to amenities in your community, that's an intervention we can all understand. I don't think that's even socialism, uh, wanting to have access to amenities in your community. Influenced by Lisa's work, we looked at 
percent of those lacking so social support by deprivation of residential area. The more deprived, the more likely are people to lack social supports. And again, influenced by Lisa's pioneering work, a recent review looked at social isolation and loneliness and in 120 studies or something, it was some vast number of studies and a 50% excess risk of coronary heart disease. If we look at the area rating of facilities and look at poor rated health, the worse the community, the rating of facilities in the community, the worse the health. Problems in the area, the fewer the problems, the better the health. Really practical, low level intellectual interventions at the community level can make a difference to the social gradient in health. I said at the beginning, that a big question when you do a commission like this is anybody listening? We did a survey of European countries of what they were doing in relation to our recommendations on social determinants of health. And it wasn't bad. Uh, cluster one, relatively positive and active response to health inequalities. The UK, Belgium, the Nordic countries, not bad. Sweden has actually fallen behind. Uh, some political reasons for that. Cluster two, a variable response to health inequalities. Cluster three, we're being polite here, relatively undeveloped. That means they're doing bugger all um, on health inequalities. And we then repeated that survey to see were countries getting better or worse. One of the interesting uh, responses was I presented these data in a meeting in Brussels and the Minister of Health from Ireland said, you've got to come to Ireland. I can see we're doing worse. Uh, come and talk to us in Ireland what we should be doing. We've had several requests for countries that feel badly that they're not doing enough and they want to do better. We've actually hit quite a well of interest of countries, European countries, that really want to act on this. In England, three quarters of local authorities have marmot implementation plans. I met a local councillor, not health, a local government person from Manchester, and she said, oh, you're marmot. I didn't think marmot was a person. We. <laughs> We talk about implementing Marmot. Um, the King's Fund, whoops, the, the King's Fund in Britain did a survey of local government and asked them what their priorities were in terms of health and well-being. The number one priority were Marmot principles. We've actually got on the agenda. They've taken our report and they're trying to implement it. And it's happening all across England, and now we're getting communities in the Nordic countries, in Slovenia, and going to Montenegro. I'm not even sure I know where Montenegro is um, soon. We've got countries that are picking this up and saying we want to implement it. It's making a difference. So, increasing life expectancy is to be celebrated. It is a societal success. But health equity should be one of the major criteria of a just society. You know, in doing the European review, we're dealing with Tashkent, we're dealing with Kyrgyzstan and Kazakhstan, countries that are doing absolutely nothing in terms of social policies that might address health equity. So we said, if you're in a country where you're doing nothing, doing something will make a difference. If you're in Poland or the Czech Republic where you're doing something and it's not bad, do more. And if you're in Sweden, do it better. Do something, do more, do better. I leave it to you to decide whether you're more like Kazakhstan or you're more like Sweden. Thank you.